Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, who will now take the national anthem to formally signify the opening of this program. While well, we're still standing, I want to invite for the opening prayer. We had just been Sirat al Lazina and Amta Alehim, Al Mursali, or Alhamdulillah, here on the Thank you. Progressive Congress APC as party of series of activities towards its convention scheduled to hold tomorrow, Saturday, 26th of March, 2022. I am indeed delighted for the opportunity to present a welcome address as the chairman of the pre-convention policy conference committee, which is co-chaired by my senior brother, Dr. Kayode Payne, the executive governor of Ikiti State. It is my singular honor and privilege to welcome you all and thank you most sincerely for finding time to be part of this important event. It is my pleasure to particularly welcome our eminent resource persons and thank them most sincerely for accepting to be part of the deliberations despite their obvious tight schedules. As you are aware, the team of the conference is consolidating democratic change, scorecard impact and the road ahead it is a tradition the world over and the world over for political parties, especially at conventions to organize policy conferences and dialogues as platforms for self-assessment and scorecard presentation. Interestingly, in Nigeria, since the return of constitutional democracy in 1999, this is the first time that the ruling political party is organizing a policy conference preceding its national convention. This conference is coming in the hills of our national convention in which a new leadership will emerge that will lead the APC to victory in 2023, God willing. The theme of the conference is self-explanatory. It sets out to achieve basically three main objectives. One, to appraise the role of a political party, but in this case, particularly the APC, in the consolidation of democracy and democratic principles. To present the APC scorecard as a ruling party in the last seven years with a view to bringing about issue-driven national discourse. To aggregate all the issues addressed during the conference towards shutting a course or building a strong, virile, and democratic institution ready to face the huge challenges of nation building. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is against this background that the media, the organized private sector, civil society, and other important stakeholders in the democracy have been made part of this event. Responsibility bearers like ministers, heads of extra ministerial departments, are expected to give a scorecard thereby striking the requisite nexus between party manifesto and government programs and activities. Subnational governments will also present record of synergy and collaboration between them and the central government. Some selected state governors will address the conference and share experiences with a view to filling up gaps where they exist. Of particular interest to this conference, and indeed the party, is the management of legislative state of executive relations, which is a problematic issue when in well-developed democracies, even in well-developed democracies. How far has the FEC government in states and federal governments managed this and with what outcomes? Clearly, the ideology of the FEC is undoubtedly social democratic, going by its people centered reforms. As COVID 19 has brought so many things hitherto unknown to our social, social economic fabrics, how do we as a global players align and position Nigeria as a leader of the entire black race? It is at this critical crossroads that this conference will address the fundamentals of policy and ideas in driving growth and development. Once again, I'd like to express our profound gratitude and appreciation on behalf of the pre-convention policy conference committee to each and every one for attending this event. We are indeed pleased to host you all.
And let me also use this opportunity to convey my deep appreciation to the Secretary and other members of this very important committee for the great works that they have been doing since we inaugurated them. We remain eternally grateful to all of you. I thank you all most sincerely for your attention and wish you successful deliberations and safe return to our respective destinations. Thank you very much. Excellency, for your show of commitment. the national chairman of the Kateka Cum Extraordinary Convention Planning Committee, CECPC, Governor Malabuni, Governor of Yobe State. And as you can understand, there are so many issues that still have to be attended to before we get to convention grounds tomorrow. So if you don't see him here, it's not an expression of lack of interest in what we're doing here, which as you heard from Governor Zulum, is the first of its kind. Uh, that a party sits back and reflect on what it has done as a ruling party over the last six and a half years and also present the scorecard as well as what the future holds for a succeeding prayerfully APC administration. And what I would like to do, you've had His Excellency the Chairman of this subcommittee espouse the objectives of this policy conference. But I think it's important for those of us who may not recall where we have come from and the journey that brought us to this point to try and cast your mind back to 2013 when this journey started that eventually led to the merger of the CPC, ACN, ANPP, a section of ABGA, and a section of DPP at the time. The new PDP joined us later, but at the original uh, period, these were the parties that merged. And there were processes that were put in place by the leadership of the party, resulting in the constitution of this party which clearly makes the ideological case for where the party was headed at the time. And by the time we held our first convention and replaced the interim leadership of the party with a substantive elected leadership under the chairmanship of Governor John Oyegun. There was work already going on on the manifesto of the party. Of course, the president went round the entire length and breadth of this country as the candidate of our party after the historic Lagos primaries convention in December 2014 which I had the rare privilege of chairing at the time, and campaigned on a three-pronged program. Security, the growth of the economy, and of course, improved governance. Welcome, my Honorable Minister of Finance, National Planning and Budget, Adia Zainab Ahmed. So, he campaigned on that three-pronged program. But we actually have a manifesto that encapsulates a vision that is wider than that in 2015. Although there are so many versions of the manifesto, if you Google now, you will find 
a whole range of manifestos claiming to be the APC manifesto. I had the privilege of serving as the director of policy strategy of the party in that 2015 campaign. So I can, with some authority, tell you what we campaigned on. And when you see what the government has done in the last six and a half years, one of the important reasons why we need this policy conference for members and also for the media is not to allow others define us. We must own the narrative of the change agenda that this party has implemented. Because it's so easy now to forget where this country was in 2014-2015. And I think the summary in your program captures what the McKinsey report, an independent body, said about where Nigeria was in 2014. This country has gone through two cycles of recession and came out of it faster than any other country. We have also, in spite of the paralysis caused by COVID-19 in the last two years, the Honorable Minister will probably talk more about this, we have also, as a party, embarked on a range of transformational initiatives. People don't want to acknowledge it. Even sometimes party members don't say it loud enough. But you just need to go around. I was going to Azare uh, about two months ago now. And I drove from Kano on a brand new dual carriageway that took me to Azare. And I was told that that same road actually goes all the way to Damaturu and almost entering Meduguri. At the time I traveled, it probably has entered Meduguri now uh, in, in, in construction. But that's not the only one. It, all over this country, you will see the efforts of the government in spite of the limited resources available to us. The other day, somebody said on Twitter, oh, Fayemi should come and explain. He was director of policy. He told us that they will establish regional development commissions. And I said, yes, I'll come and explain. Yes, we have established regional development commissions. The Northeast Development Commission now exists. <laughs> NDDC is there. IPADEC is there. The bills for the Southwest Development Commission and Southeast Development Commission is going through the National Assembly as we speak. Yes, that was a manifesto agenda for this government, and we are implementing it. You can leave that and talk about jobs. Yes, recession and COVID had seen job losses. There's no question about it. But this country has never experienced the extent of the social investment program that we have put in place in its history. We haven't. And those who are beneficiaries of the support this government has put around the country to the most vulnerable segment of our population would confirm the passion, the compassion, and the commitment of our president to the plight of the ordinary citizens of this country. And that is why it is so important that as a party, we should use the opportunity of this convention, not just to elect our leaders, but to also speak for ourselves. Gone are the days when you will say, let my work speak for me. The president we know is not a man of many words. However, we the field commanders, we the foot soldiers, we those who would be left behind when Mr. President is no longer with us, 
we must own the narrative, have the manifesto on the one hand, and have the performance record of our government on the other hand, and sell it to Nigerians. Even when the media may not be our best friend, we need to ensure that we get them to recognize the significant development that had happened under this government, in spite of the limited resources available to us. People must ask themselves, how are we even surviving? I don't know how the Honorable Minister sleeps. I doubt if she sleeps. And when we also talk about this, we don't talk about the transformations happening at the subnational level. Our governments are doing exceedingly well at the subnational level. Yes, there are 22 of us. If you take the scorecard and you review what is happening in the 22 states, transformation may not be one big bang but we must also recognize reforms in bits. We must recognize developments at the subnational level and aggregate this development in order to paint an accurate and correct picture of what this party is. And when they tell you that we are not different, you know, all parties are the same. We can't see the difference. It's absolute nonsense. We're not the same as PDP, for goodness sake. We are not. And we may have forgotten what happened in this country up till 2015. The level of criminality and brigandage that this country witnessed. What was happening? with insurgency pre-2015 that the president got to office and the rare courage, the commitment, the demonstration of leadership that we see from our governor in that state. And this is happening all over Nigeria. Yes, there may be reduced money in our pockets. Our president is not a chua chua president. He doesn't, you know him, I don't have to, to tell you about him. He may not be comfortable, and he is certainly not comfortable distributing monies that he can use to do things that will benefit us collectively and share it amongst individuals. That's not his own DNA. And that is not the DNA of this party. We do not believe in the trickle-down economics of the PDP. We believe that all of us, rich, poor, vulnerable, disabled, women, men, must be given the opportunity to excel. That is what this party is about. It's a party of equal opportunity for the citizens of Nigeria. And that certainly is what you would be hearing in the scorecard that will be presented by our ministers, by our governors, and by other independent but critical stakeholders that we have invited to this policy conference. It is the first of its kind to reflect on our past, to present our scorecard, and to give a pathway to the future. That is who we are. That is not always what we are presented as by the media. It's time for all of us, as committed members of this party, to own the narrative to define what change has done to Nigeria and to exemplify the numerous achievements of our government concretely. And there are concrete examples. These are not uh, what uh, social media youngsters call audio. 
these are not audio achievements. We're talking about concrete achievements. And I'm sure when you hear the Honorable Minister speak, she will speak to those issues. And you can take it from our manifesto to the ERGP, and from ERGP now to the National Development Plan that has just been released. You can see the interconnectedness in agriculture and rural development, in infrastructure development, in the knowledge economy, in social investment, in healthcare, in education. These are clear, concrete, definable achievements of our government. And it is something we should be proud of. Have we solved all problems? Obviously, we have not. No party solves all problems. No government solves all problems. But we are on a trajectory that is better positioned to rescue this country from what we had witnessed under 16 years of perdition that the PDP represented. And we're going into an election in 2023. They will present their scorecard. We will present our scorecard. And Nigerians will be able to judge us. Thank you. God bless you all. Please put your hands together for me. Thank you. It's a first. And it's not surprising that it's entrusted to someone who can do it, Professor Babagana Umara. And certainly, in both the remarks we have had, we have a test of the importance of what is being done here today and what is certainly a first. But I've been put at a disadvantage having to speak after Professor Zulum, the chairman of the um, Nigerian Governors Forum, who spoke as representative of the chairman of our party, Member Labuni, and I'm sure as he repeatedly said, uh, Minister of Finance, who is going to, so I don't want to preempt what the minister will say. And I'm sure she has a lot to say. And at the same time, I don't want to bore you with the repetition of what has been said by, but we are in the heart of the 22 governors at a conference like this, what will one say that should resonate with the public, especially the public that enthusiastically gave us their mandate in 2015? Have we done well? I think the chairman has already answered it, and I share in it. Yes, we have. But it doesn't matter if you have done well or not. If you can't communicate it, that's another tragedy. And how do we develop a consensus on those items that can be communicated, particularly to the teeming millions of Nigerians that enthusiastically supported the APC? Well, we need to all, at all times, remind, remember the uh, three items on which we campaign, or on which President Muhammad Buhari led us to campaign. The security, economy, and accountability. Because without a reference point, it will be anybody's there will be no standard to measure. And I believe in all the three we have done extremely well. Borno State Governor told us how a bumper harvest was witnessed in the last harvest season. And that is a combination of success in both three. Security improvements, value for money, and I 
amazing performer supported by political leaders and society that is eager to demonstrate what change means is bringing peace is bringing prosperity is bringing accountability and use value generate imbibing value for money and the results are showing and i'm sure not only people from borno but anybody who is conversant with what is being reported from borno will agree to that and it's not only and it's not only in borno Yesterday in Kaduna, a maze pyramid was unveiled. It might be, it might seem trivial, it might seem insignificant, but it goes to the transformation that is happening at the lower level of society, where millions of farmers across the country are being mobilized and being supported by the mental policy by credit from governmental institutions that are reflective of the vision of Mr. President of our party. And these farmers are now having the opportunity to generate higher yields. Some of them multiple cropping and providing both food and raw materials for our increasingly growing industries. Even in spite of the Russian-Ukrainian challenge, we are not at the risk of food shortages in Nigeria. And this is a big, big story because the whole of West Africa is buying from us, but yet we are managing to cope. And this couldn't have been a coincidence. It was a result of deliberate, proactive policies that were put in place to ensure that that's a big story for me that I think every APC member should be conversant with and should be armed to explain to others. Not only are farmers, but fishing communities, but and pastoral communities, and indeed social investment programs that are also pushing the uh, investment in domestic production. So no doubt the president is in different states almost on a weekly or fortnightly basis. The president was in Lagos a few days ago, where remarkably he launched, he commissioned the 3 million metric ton Dangote fertilizer urea plant, which will make Nigeria self sufficient in fertilizer. We were told at the commissioning that the Construction started in 2017. And president of the company, Ali Kodangote, thanked government policy, thanked Nigerian financial sector for making that dream possible. Without policy steadiness, with split flops in policy, it wouldn't have happened. Equally, president inspected the Angote refinery, the lake the Lake Deep Sea Port, as well as uh, commissioning a new terminal in Mujula Mohammed. That the Lagos State Governor told us that that was Mr. President's third visit to Lagos commissioning projects. Mr. President was in Kaduna about a month ago. Mr. President was in different states of the APC and he's even lined up to visit many more because APC and APC governors are under pressure to show President Buhari that we all live his vision. We all in our own different ways are cognizant 
of the trust that Nigerians have given us and we are determined to pay back. Yes, somebody can still say, but there are people out there who are unhappy. And again, Governor Fahemi has spoken to that. And maybe yes, but there are people out there, more people out there who are happy, who are seeing incomes going into their pockets that has never happened before as a result of deliberate, conscious, transformative thought processes. And all this is happening at a time when the resource available to the government have been limited by the, by the challenges of the need to provide subsidy for petroleum prices, of the need to contain, to provide more resources, and to do so in a transparent, non-discriminatory manner that the president has been doing, assisted by the Minister of Finance. From a president that inherited 27 states that could not pay salaries, most of them opposition states, and yet he supported all of us, not only to pay salaries, but even to pay pension and gratuities. The Minister of Finance, sometimes we even think she's over generous to the opposition, but that's the kind of culture that President has instilled in all of us, where all states are equal, all constituent parts of Nigeria are equal, and President, to the best of his ability, is uh, supporting all parts of Nigeria in a sincere, transparent manner. Before the Minister speaks, I think it's important for Nigerians to contextualize this so that we can appreciate what president has led the government, both federal and state, to do with so little. Just three days ago, the federation allocation account was shared, less than 700 billion naira. At the official rate of exchange, a billion naira is about 410 billion Naira, meaning the pack that was shared between the federal government, states, and local government is less than $2 billion a month. So even if it is at $2 billion, that means in a year we will share $24 billion. Too small. Too small for a country of 200 million people. The federal budget 35 billion dollar there about. And thanks to the National Assembly that have instilled, consistent with the vision of Mr. President, a transparent, proactive budget process with budget performance near 100%. But still, 35 billion dollar is too small. Every time I see the Minister of Finance or she sees my call, I'm sure she's eager to get it off because she knows it might go to the money matter and maybe I'm the least demanding. That's the reality. We need quantums of money more than we have. But before then, we need to appreciate that the little that we have has been good to put to, put to good use. And that is a major story because across Nigeria, across all zones today, there is an important federal project, road, rail, port, name it, and social inclusiveness project that you'll wonder how is it that this little money is doing so much. And that is, I think, what APC sh members should clap for themselves. <laughs> Compared to a country of about 200 million people, Brazil, with over 650 billion US dollar 
budget, meaning that our budget is about 5% that of Brazil, but yet we are able to exit recession two times in a row, quick enough because of probity, accountability, and putting money where it is doing the best use, mobilizing our economy, mobilizing our economic potential. No wonder we are recording the successes and gains we are doing in agriculture, in mining, and in basic processing to the extent that a new mill, I will conclude here because I know other people, but in the president's remark at Dangote Industries, he reminded us how when he came in, when we came in 2015, there is not one fertilizer plant that is working. Today we have 57 fertilizer blending plants that are working. In the last four years, I have personally visited 22 new rice mills, each having at least 30,000 uh, metric tons per year processing capacity. And I believe that no less than 10,000 small-scale mills have been given to women in the last five years. And the economy is supporting us all. The, a hedge fund that invested in one of the rice mills once said to me, they feel as if they are printing money. This is what APC has done to Nigeria to draw attention to the greatness, to the vastness of our potential, to put money to proper use where it can generate value, to encourage us to believe in ourselves, which we are increasingly seeing. That is why Aliko can risk putting $17 billion to do a refinery. That's why he can risk putting $2.5 billion to do a fertilizer plant because you know this vision, this stability of policy that APC has brought will give certainty to the contracts he has entered among many other investors and Nigeria will be the better for it. Yes, we sympathize with the Minister of Finance for losing a lot of weight and losing a lot of sleep. But I'm sure she's a very, very happy person, given that Nigerians at the lower end of the income strata are getting wealthier, are getting happier, and that's what we promised Nigeria. I congratulate all of us in the APC. I congratulate President Muhammad Buhari and the chairman of the pre-convention conference, Professor Babagana Maros. Thank you. Take the better part of the period, I want us to go straight into the issues for Barre. But the highest revenue that was recorded, I think if I'm not mistaken, is around 2011 under PDP, was around 11 trillion naira. Under APC, until recently, the highest oil prices has reached was about $70 per barrel. But in May last year, at that rate, the federal government recorded revenue almost equal to the highest revenue that was recorded under PDP of 11 trillion naira. It wasn't 11 trillion, I think it's, it's 10.9 something trillion naira in May last year. The records are there. And when you talk of roads construction, over 13,000 kilometer roads are being constructed or rehabilitated or reconstructed. New industries are being commissioned, and I think just last week the fertilizer industry was commissioned. 
and one of the first rice milling industry that was commissioned, I think, in either 2016 or 2017, was in Kirby State. There, after many more rice milling factory, and I think the His Excellency Governor Bagudu has mentioned the number now that they are in existence. So, without going into all this detail, I think as oh, much away, and we started breaking it down. What does this mean? First of all, it means agriculture and food security. So that was one of our guiding uh, uh, execution priorities. But also infrastructure development, macroeconomic stability, development of manufacturing industries, but special emphasis on small, medium enterprises. And of course, a cross-cutting issue being social investment, human capital development, and developing the capacity of our people using technology. So my presentation is around a number of concentric issues. I'll just touch a bit about everything. His Excellency Governor Fayami and also Governor Kebi has very clearly indicated that we actually from the get-go started with the challenge. So this is the time when revenue crashed. We were facing revenue decline by as much as 60% of what was in the previous year. 2015, the budget that we inherited was a budget size of about five trillion. We grew that budget to six, then to seven. Today we are at 16 trillion budget, and this is a time of little revenue. But what is important of, of our, uh, about our budgets is they're not just budgets. So people announce budgets. We actually fund the budgets. Our 2020 budget was funded 100%. <laughs> our budget performance has increased significantly. Aggregate budget performance for 2021 is about 85%, despite all of the constraints. We have grown our revenue and moved away from dependency from oil revenues to non-oil revenues. So while we started with oil revenues being about 70% of our budget, now we are at the point when non-oil revenues is 65% of our budget. So the, the Nigerian economy is truly diversified. Today, our GDP from the oil sector is 8%, which means 92% of the uh, uh, economy is the non-oil sector. So we don't speak to the fact that we have a diversified economy. Instead, what we have to do is actually deepen that diversification, expand and grow the individual sectors to do more because the capacity is there. Of course, we have a lot of challenges. What keeps me awake is revenue. Domestic revenue mobilization is our key focus in the Ministry of Finance, Budget, and National Planning. And we set out by designing a program that we call the Strategic Revenue Growth Initiative. Through this initiative, we've been able to grow non-oil revenues and make it a major source of income right now. We've been able to uh, plug uh, fiscal drainers and also enhance the efficiency of the revenue collection ecosystem. The Finance Act also was designed to, to cause about incremental fiscal reforms in, in, the, in the fiscal system in Nigeria. So we introduced the Finance Act. We started from Finance Act 2019. We did the 2021. We did the 2022. We also made a commitment in the SRGI to return the budget cycle from January to December. People say, what's the big deal about that? Well, the big deal about that is that the whole of the country, especially the states and the private sector, actually look on the federal government budget to guide its own plans. So luckily for us, we, had, we have a very, very accommodative and pre, uh, friendly National Assembly and we're able to do this together. 
the finance acts also give us an opportunity to plug to amend laws that have acted as fiscal drainers to also introduce new taxes that's how we brought uh, we include we increase vat from five percent to 7.5 percent to introduce several other amendments that are helping us realize more revenue but we also use the finance act to make government more efficient improving the procurement system and improving remittances from government owned enterprises today one provision in the finance act has fixed revenue to income ratio of government enterprises to 50 percent that means an agency cannot spend more than 50 percent of the revenue they generated and what did this result in we saw a jump in our independent revenues from 200 billion in 2015 to 1.3 trillion in 2021 so the, for the first time in history the country saw the passing of the one trillion threshold from independent revenues. That's revenue from just government-owned uh, enterprises. So this has been uh, useful and it has been an interesting journey. And uh, we have made a commitment and with the support of the National Assembly, that will always be finance acts that will accompany the national budget because they act as instruments for the better implementation of the budget. Nigeria has one of the, no, not one of, Nigeria has the fastest growing social investment program in the world today. And this is amidst a time when at some point we saw a $20 per barrel crude. The social investment program has up to 15 million beneficiaries today and it is expanding. The states have been supported by, by the dedication, uh, by, by the support, uh, by the director from the, His Excellency the President, and the President said he is a president to all Nigerians, and he did not allow that there should be any discrimination regardless of which party the state is leaning towards. When we design programs, it's designed for all. And when we implement and fund programs, it is done for all states of the Federation. The monetary authorities have also done very well by monthly looking at the monetary space and making incremental adjustments to support the fiscal uh, authorities. They provided a lot of intervention funds that is helping businesses to grow. We witnessed two cycles of two, two rounds of recessions and exited the first one within four quarters. And during the COVID year, 2020, we went into a very deep recession, but by Allah's grace, we exited it in one quarter. There's no country in the world that had exited recession within one quarter at the level at which Nigeria jumped out of recession. And why, how did this happen? It was because of the fiscal crisis response that we rolled out very quickly, and also the implementation of the economic sustainability plan, which was systematic and designed to cover the different aspects of the economy that matter the most. So we had a 500 billion naira crisis fund, uh, response facility within the ESP, we were able to very quickly access 190 million US dollars from a World Bank Regional Disease Refurbishment Investment Tax Credit Scheme, the RITC for short. This is a scheme that was launched in January 2019 to leverage private sector capital and expertise to construct, repair, and maintain critical road infrastructure in key economic uh, creditors, corridors. This scheme is designed to complement government funding. So federal, private sector choose a road together with the Minister of Work, the road design and costing is agreed. They build the road with their money and they recover their funds and investment, including cost of capital over time through tax credit. So this scheme has seen the uptake of several roads across the country 
and together today collectively we have a total of 1.1565 1, uh, kilometers of roads as at the end of 2021 approved under the state. Once there is no peace, there is no security. Once there is no security, there is no development. And I want to bring to your kind notice on the security situation in the entire northeastern states before the advent of this administration. Yes, I'm very much aware of the existing security situation in the Northwest. But to the best of my knowledge, the security situation in Borno Borno State have greatly improved. The security situation in the entire northern northeastern states, speaking as the chairman of the Northeast Governors Forum, has greatly improved. And this is not by fault. It was. It is by design. Prior to the advent of this administration, particularly in Borno State, about 22 local government areas in Borno State out of the 27 local government areas are under the control of the insurgents. Particularly in Borno State, out of about six major roads that we have in the state, at the time we have only one, we had only one major road, which is open to commuters to fly, which is the road between Maiduguri to Kano. All other roads in Borno State are closed completely. So you can imagine the cumbersome nature of what we had before. But fortunately enough, all our roads are now completely open. None of the 27 local government area, areas are under the control of Boko Haram. Two of the local government areas that are not occupied by human population will soon be occupied, especially one will be occupied this year, this month. And I hope this administration has done well in this direction, notwithstanding the security challenges that we are facing in northwestern Nigeria and other, and in other parts of the country. We hope the administration will address the issue of security situation in other parts of the country. But what are we doing? On the part of the federal government, I think many equipments were procured to the Nigerian army. Intelligent gathering has been increased. But on the part of the Borno State, what we did most importantly that has been able to reduce the insurgency is the resilience of the community. We became resilient enough to fight back the insurgency. And I think this is something which is very important for each and everybody to note. Another issue that I want you to understand is, the, is how, we can reduce, how we reduce the trust deficit between the population and the government. I think this is something that each and every state has to do. Once there is a gap between the government and the government, that means there should the gap between the population and the government. Trust de increasing trust deficit between the military and the population, increasing trust deficit between the government and the population has been reduced drastically. Because they have seen what we did, we are committed to ensuring development in the state. We did what all what we could to promote good governance in concrete, in measurable terms to the electorates. Then at the state level also, what we did was that we also supported our civilian JTF. We have strengthened the capacities of our civilian because security is each and everybody's business. By so doing, we have gone far. And then most importantly, what we did is to address the root causes of the insurgency, which are not limited to increasing infrastructural deficit, increasing poverty, and increasing climate vulnerabilities. 
Within the last two and a half years, we built, we provided more than 700 projects. <laughs> By doing so, we are addressing the root causes of the insurgency. When you are speaking about the resettlement, the first thing that somebody has to do in resettlement is to ensure that civil authorities are establishing different LGAs. That means we built schools, we built health centers, we built community leaders' houses, and so on, that would ensure establishment of civil authorities on ground. Borno State, in the last three, seven years, we built more than 40,000 houses, both low cost and medium cost. The federal government has provided enough support, substantial number of support in terror to Borno State. 10,000 homes were constructed, were constructed by the federal government in Borno State. Again, the humanitarian support, the Ministry of Humanitarian Appears, NEMA, and indeed the establishment of the Northeast Development Commission has gone far in ensuring the return of peace to Borno State. And then the last but not the least, when the issue of education, the federal government has created more universities within the last three years. <laughs> Borno State has never had the opportunity of having federal polytechnic. We had one federal polytechnic under this administration. And Federal College of Education is also coming up to Borno State. Yes, we still have some problems in the education sector. But since we have more schools, I believe the federal government will do everything possible to ensure that facilities and teachers are being provided. We resettled nothing fewer than about 400,000 population to their hometowns. And let me also bring to your kind notice that the worst form of insecurity is food insecurity. During the last seven years, during the last, last eight years, not more than 5% of our total land were cultivated. This is a very serious matter. matter. We have yesterday a total number of about 49,311 widows, and a total of about 49,690 orphans. These are all government. With the support of the state government, we co-jointly financed the rehabilitation of almost all classrooms in Borno State. <laughs> we have resettled back people. We are elected to serve the people, and under no circumstances, we shall sleep at our comfort zone, while the majority of the people of Borno State, and indeed that of the Northeast region, are suffering in, in the streets. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity.